morning prayer daily throughout the year. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy servant. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins, yet ought we chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the benefits we have received at his hands, and to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary for the body as well as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. We have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent and humble. According to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all those who truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to help us. O Lord, make haste to save us. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. In the Lord's name be praised. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is the Lord our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, 
And as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted us, tempted me, proved me and saw my works, forty days long I was grieved with that generation. And they said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, but they have not known my ways, on whom I swear in my wrath, that they should not enter my rest. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We continue our work in Psalm 11, verses 5 and 6. Because of the spoiling of the needy, because of the groaning of the poor, now, will I arise, says the Lord. I will set in safety him for whom the wicked man layeth snares. David now sets before himself a matter of consolation, the truth that God will not suffer the wicked to make havoc without end and measure, the more effectually to establish himself and others in the belief in this truth, he introduces God himself as speaking. The expression is more emphatic than uh, when God is represented as coming forward and declaring with his own mouth that he has come to deliver the poor and the distressed. There's also a great emphasis in the verb now by which God intimates that although our safety is in his hand, and therefore in secure keeping, yet he does not immediately grant deliverance from affliction. For his words imply that he had hitherto been, as it were, lying still and asleep until he was awakened by the calamities and cries of his people. When therefore the injuries, the extortions, and the devastations of our enemies leave us nothing but tears and groans, let us remember that now the time is at hand when God intends to rise up to execute judgment. This doctrine should also serve to produce in us patience and prevent us from taking it ill that we are reckoned among the number of the poor and afflicted whose God promises to take into his own hand. Joshua chapter 11, verse 16. Verse 23, actually not 16. Thus Joshua took the whole land. The history of the conquest of Canaan by Joshua was brought to a close in 23b. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel. Forms a kind of introduction to the second part of the book. The list of the conquered kings in chapter 12 is simply an appendix to the first part. The taking of the whole land does not imply that all the towns and villages to the very last had been conquered, or that all the Canaanites were rooted out from every corner of the land, but simply that the conquest was of such a character that the power of the Canaanites was broken, the dominion overthrown, and their whole land so thoroughly given into the hand of the Israelites that those who still remained here and there were crushed into powerless fugitives who could neither offer any further opposition to the Israelites or dispute the possession of the land with them if they would only strive to fulfill the commands of God and preserve in the gradual extermination of the scattered remnants. Moreover, Israel had received the strongest pledge and the powerful help which it had received from the Lord in the conquests thus obtained. 
that the faithful covenant God would continue his help in the conflicts which still remain and secure for it a complete victory and the full possession of the promised land. Looking therefore at the existing state of things from this point of view, Joshua had taken possession of the whole land and could now proceed to finish the work entrusted to him by the Lord by dividing the land among the tribes. And Isaiah 6, 2, 6 through 8, last time he was talking about the insatiable greed of the Israelites who were mal truculent, malcontents, and covetous. <clears throat> Back yet, God himself was their God, the sole object of worship, and he himself instituted the ordinances of worship for them. But they slighted both him and his institutions. Therefore the land is full of idols, every city has its God. And according to the goodness of their lands, they made goodly images. Hosea 10.1 Those that think one God too little will find two too many, and yet hundreds not sufficient. For those that love idols will multiply them. So sottish were they, and so wretchedly infatuated. They worshipped the work of their own hands, as if they could be a god to them, which was not only a creature, but their creature, and that which was their own fancies had devised, and their own fingers had made. It was an aggravation of their idolatry that God had enriched them with silver and gold, and yet of that silver and gold they made idols. So it was yet Jeshurun wax fat and wicked. Hosea 2 8. And now for Matthew talking about the birth of Christ, where the theological conference has been called by Herod with the question in mind about where is the Messiah to be born? And then he gets the answer. Meanwhile, the Holy Family in Bethlehem is unaware of the pending vulnerability, yet are under the divine sovereign protection. And the story must well have made it to the ears of the Holy Family when the Magi finally came. And here's the answer, not least among the princes of Judah shall come forth a governor. The quotation, though differing verbally, agrees substantially with the Hebrew and Septuagint. For, says the prophet, though thou be little, yet out of thee shall come the ruler. This honor more than compensating for the natural insignificance. While our evangelist by a lively turn makes him to say thou art not the least <coughs> <coughs> for out of thee shall come from the lowest to the highest rank the thousands of Judah in the prophet being the subordinate divisions of the tribe our evangelist instead of these merely names the princes or heads of these families including the districts which they occupy Thou shalt rule, boy, mene, or feed, or shepherd, my people Israel. The Old Testament kings are by a beautiful figure called shepherds, Ezekiel 34. The classical writers use the same figure. The pastoral rule of Jehovah and Messiah over his people is a representation pervading all scripture and rich in import at the prophecy of micah referred to the messiah was admitted by the ancient rabbis
And now for Revelation. And the martyrs who cry out for justice. John observed what kind of return was made to this cry, both what was given to them and what was said to them. What was given to them was white robes, the robes of victory and honor. Their present happiness was an abundance recompense of their sufferings. What was said to them that they should be satisfied and easy in themselves for it would not be long ere the number of their fellow sufferers should be fulfilled. This is a language rather suited to the imperfect state of the saints in this world than to the perfection of their state in heaven. There is no impatience, no uneasiness, no need of admonition, but in this world there is great need of patience. Observe one, there is a number of Christians known to God who are appointed as sheep for the slaughter, set apart to be God's witnesses. As the measure of the sin of the persecutors is filling up, so the number of the persecuted martyr servants of Christ. When this number is fulfilled, God will make a just and glorious revenge upon the cruel persecutors. He will recompense tribulation to those who trouble them and to those who that are troubled for an uninterrupted rest. And now for Prof. Raymond, who's been discussing his unhappiness with Dr. Packer's use of the term antinomies in scripture. For example, human responsibility and predestination. Now, if one has conceded that the Bible can and does teach that truths may come to human existence in paradoxical terms, it begs the question to respond to this by insisting that one must simply believe what the Bible says about these other claims to truth and reject those that contradict the Bible. Why should either proposition of the declared contradiction be preferred to the other when applying scripture to contradicting truth claims? Why not simply live with one or more unresolved antithesis. The only solution is to deny two paradox if understood as irreconcilable contradictories, a legitimate place in the theory of truth, recognizing it for what it is, the offspring of an irrational age. If there is to be an offense in Christianity's truth claims, it should be the ethical implications of the cross of Christ and not the irrationality of contradictories proclaimed to men as both being true. Certainly there are biblical concepts that we cannot fully understand. We may never be able to explain them for example, how God created something from nothing, how he can raise someone from the dead, or how the spirit quickens the unregenerate. See John 8, 31. Footnote, if someday he tells us how he did these things, then, of course, we will be able to understand that. Such concepts are mysteries to us. But they are not contradictions in terms Again, it is true that the living God, upon occasion, employed paradoxes, understood as apparent but reconcilable contradictories in his spoken word. But he did so for the same reason that we employ them, as a rhetorical or literary device, to invigorate the thought being expressed, to awaken human interest, to intrigue, to contradict the intellect, 
to shock and frustrate the lazy mind. But the notion that any of God's truth will always appear to the human existent contradictory must be rejected. Specifically, the notion of the cardinal doctrines of the faith, the Trinity, the person of Christ, the doctrines of grace when proclaimed aright must be proclaimed as contradictory constructs is a travesty. I'm not sure he answered Van Til or Dr. Gordon Clark, but he does not like the terms. We return now to Prof. Hookoff regeneration and effectual calling, talking about the Reformed and Protestant churches. The distinction between regeneration and justification had already become clearer, but it gradually became necessary and customary to employ the term regeneration in a more restricted sense. Turretin defines two kinds of conversion. First, a habitual or passive conversion, the production or disposition of a habit of the soul, which he wrote, remarks might be better called regeneration. And secondly, an actual and active conversion in which this implanted habit or disposition becomes active in faith and repentance. In present-day Reformed theology, the word regeneration is generally used in a more restricted sense as a designation of that divine act by which the sinner is endowed with new life and by which the principle of the new life is called into action. So conceived, it both includes begetting again and the new birth, why would you say both, in which the new life becomes manifest. In strict harmony, however, with the literal meaning of the word regeneration, the term is sometimes employed in an even more limited sense to denote simply the implanting of a new life in the soul apart from the first manifestations of this life. The modern liberal theology, regeneration, acquired a different meaning. Schleiermacher dis distinguished two aspects of regeneration, namely conversion and justification, and held that in regeneration, a new religious consciousness is produced in the believer by the common spirit of community, Christian, of community, new life, or sanctification is prepared for. That the Christian spirit of the community is the result of an influx of the divine life through Christ into the church and is called the Holy Spirit by Schleiermacher. This, the modern view is well stated in these words of Utes. Modern interpretation inclines to return to the symbolic use of the concept of regeneration. Our ethical realities deal with transformed characters. Regeneration thus expresses, expresses a radical, vital, ethical change rather than an absolute new metaphysical beginning. Regeneration is a vital step in the natural development of the spiritual life, a radical readjustment to the moral processes of life. Students of psychology of religion generally fail to distinguish between regeneration and conversion. They regard it as a process in which man's attitude to life changes from the autocentric to the heterocentric. 
It finds its explanation primarily in the subconscious life and does not necessarily involve anything supernatural. James says to be converted, to be regenerated, to receive grace, to experience religion, to gain an assurance, are so many phrases which denote the process, gradual or sudden, by which a self hitherto divided, consciously wrong, inferior and unhappy, becomes unified and consciously right, superior happy, in consequence of its firmer hold upon religious realities. According to Clark, students have agreed in discerning three distinct steps. Number one, a period of storm and stress, a sense of sin, feeling of inward disharmony known to theology as conviction of sin designated by James as soul sickness. Two, an emotional crisis which marks a start of the turning point. Three, a succeeding relaxation attended by a sense of peace, inner harmony, acceptance with God, not infrequently, and not infrequently motory and sensory reflexes of various sorts. Glad he brought in the liberals. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee, all angels cry aloud, the heavens and the powers there. To thee, cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, holy, holy. Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the apostles praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the earth doth acknowledge thee. The father of an infinite majesty, thine adorable, true and only son, and the Holy Ghost. And now for ancient church history as we review uh, church historians. He's talking about Neander and Geisler, the latter. It is purely objective and speaks with an indifference of an outside spectator. Through the ipsissima verba of the same sources arranged as notes and strung together by a slender thread of narrative. The one gives history ready-made, full of life and instruction. The other furnishes material and leaves the reader to animate and prove for himself. With the one, the text is everything, with the other, the notes. But both ad admirably compete complete each other and exhibit together the ripest fruits of German scholarship in general church history in the first half of the 19th century. Ferdinand Christian Bauer, professor of church history in Tübingen, died in 1860, must be named alongside Neander and Geisler in the front rank of church historians. He was equal to both in independent and thorough scholarship, superior in constructive criticism and philosophic generalization, but inferior in well-balanced judgment and solid merit. He overestimated theories and tendency and undervalued persons and facts. He was an indefatigable investigator and bold innovator he completely revolutionized the history of apostolic and post-apostolic Christianity and resolved its rich spiritual life and faith into a purely speculative process of conflicting tendencies, which started from the antagonism of Petronism and Paulinism 
and were ultimately reconciled in the compromise of ancient Catholicism. He brought to light by keen critical analysis the profound intellectual fermentation of the primitive church. Pretty bold here. The profound, but eliminated from it the supernatural and miraculous element. That is an honest and serious skeptic. Those words are out of place. Mercer. He had to confess at least a psychological miracle in the conversion of St. Paul and bow to the greater miracle of the resurrection of Christ, without which the former is an inexplicable enigma. His critical researches and speculation gave a powerful stimulus to a reconsideration and modification of the traditional view of early Christianity. We have from his fertile pen a history. Sounds Gail and me. Of the Christian Church in five volumes. Three of which were published after the death, his death and lack. After his death and lack, the originality and careful finish of the first second which cover the first six centuries. Lectures on Christian doctrine, Dogmata Sheik, published by his son in three volumes, and a brief Lehrbuch, Der Dog, Dogmenin Geschichte, edited by himself, 1858. Even more valuable are his monographs on St. Paul, for whom he had a profound veneration although he recognized only four of his epistles as genuine. Translated into English, 1875, on Gnosticism, with which he had a strong spiritual affinity. No kidding. De Christlicke Nosa, Walder de Christlicke, Religione Philosophia. The History of the Doctrine of the Atonement, 1838, one volume. Trinity and Incarnation, three volumes. And his masterly vindication of Protestantism against Muller, Symbola, Geek. Um, okay. <clears throat> King of glory, O Christ, thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. On thee to deliver man, thou didst not. When thou hast overcome the shark, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. I believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. Therefore, pray thee, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. Now we're talking about I've got a footnote here. Not sure what it's about. Full, laudably, and profitably as your magnificent conceived the design of propagating your glorious renown on earth and of completing your reward of eternal happiness in heaven, whilst as a Catholic prince you are intent upon enlarging the borders of the church, teaching the truth of the Christian faith to the ignorant and rude extirpating the nurseries of iniquity from the field of the Lord and for the more convenient execution of the purpose. I think this is the Pope's letter. Um, Adrian, bishop, servant of servants of God, to his dearest son in Christ, the illustrious King of England, greeting the apostolic benediction. 
in which may mature your deliberation and the greater discretion of your procedure. By so much the happier we trust will be your progress with the assistance of the Lord. Because whatever has its origin in ardent faith and in love of religion always has a prosperous end. There is indeed no doubt but that in Ireland and all the islands on which the Christ, the Son of Righteousness, has shown, and which have received the doctrines of the Christian faith, belong to the jurisdiction of St. Peter, here comes the part we disagree with, and of the Holy Roman Church, where the big boobahs, and of your excellency also acknowledges Therefore, we are the more solicitous to propagate faithful plantation among them, a seed pleasing to the Lord. This is the good part, as we have secret conviction of conscience, and a very rigorous account must be rendered of them. You then, my dearest son in Christ, have signified to us your desire to enter into the island of Ireland, that you may reduce the people to obedience to laws and extirpate nurseries of vice that you are willing to pay from pay from each house a yearly pension of one Pete penny to St. Peter. That you will preserve the rights of the church of this whole land and inviolate. We therefore, with that grace and acceptance suited to your pious and laudable design, and favorably assenting to your position, hold it good and acceptable that for the extending the borders of the church, restraining the progress of vice, for the correction of manners, the planting of virtue, and increase of Christian religion, you enter that island and execute therein whatever shall pertain to the honor of God and the welfare of the land. And that the people of the land receive you honorably and reverence you as their Lord. The rights of their church is still remaining sacred and inviolate. And saving to St. Peter the annual pension of one penny from every house. If then you are resolved to carry the design you have conceived into effectual execution, study to train that nation in virtuous manners, and labor by yourself and others whom you shall judge meet for this work. In faith, word, and life, that the church may be there adorned, and that the religion of the Christian faith may be planted and grow up that all things pertaining to the honor of God and salvation of souls be so ordered that you may be entitled to the fullness of the eternal reward in God and obtain a glorious renown throughout all ages. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name, ever world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy lighten upon us as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted, that we never be confounded. And we switch to the Swiss Reformation, talking about the work now of Philip Galicius. He was born on the eastern frontier of Graubünden in 1504, began to preach already in 1520. He's a 16-year-old boy. He had an irresistible eloquence and power of persuasion. When he spoke Romance, the people flocked from every direction to hear him. He was the chief speaker at two disp disputations in Sus, the town of the Lower Engaden, against the Papists in 1537. 
and against the Anabaptists in 1544. He also introduced the Reformation in Zeus in the Lower Engaden in 1554 with the aid of John Travers, a distinguished patriot, statesman, soldier, and lay preacher who was called the Steel-Clad Knight in the service of the Lord. Galicius suffered much persecution and poverty, but remained gentle, patient, and faithful to the end. When preaching in Domlichen, he had not even bread to feed his large family and lived for weeks on vegetables and salt. Yet he educated a son for the ministry at Basel and dissuading, dissuaded him from accepting a lucrative offer in another calling. He did as much as he could for the Italian refugees. He died of the pestilence with his wife and three sons at Cor in 1566. He translated the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, and several chapters of the Bible into the Romanche language, and thus laid the foundation for Romanche literature. He also wrote a catechism in Latin grammar, which were printed at Cor. He prepared the Confession of Raisha in 1552, which was afterwards superseded by this second Helvetic Confession of Bullinger. Now we'll begin briefly for a moment here on a third reformer in the Greek song, Ulrich Campbell, born 1510, died 1582, was a pastor at Cor and at Sous, next to Galicius, the chief reformer of Angaden. He was the first historian of Raisha and one of the founders of the relic religious literature in the Romanic Raisha. His history is written in good Latin and based upon personal observation, the accounts of the ancient Romans, the researches of the Chistuti brothers, and his communications with Bollinger and Vadian. The history begins at 100 AD and ends at 1582. From our lections and learning, we turn to recite our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and descended into hell, third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now turn to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, Larger Catechism, I'm sorry. Uh, my apology here. Question 90, what shall be done to the righteous at the day of judgment? At the day of judgment, the righteous being caught up to Christ in the clouds shall be set on the right hand and there openly acknowledged and acquitted shall join with Christ in judging of the reprobate angels and men who shall be received into heaven where they shall be fully and forever free from all sin and misery filled with inconceivable joys made perfect and happy both in body, resurrected body, and soul, in the company of innumerable saints and holy angels, but especially in the immediate vision and fruition 
of God the Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit to all eternity. This is the perfect communion which members of the invisible church shall enjoy with Christ in glory at the resurrection and day of judgment. Having seen what the scriptures principally teach us to believe concerning God, it then follows to consider what the scriptures require as the duty of man. 91. What is the duty which God requires of man? The duty which God requires of man is obedience to his revealed will. 92. What did God at first reveal unto man as the rule? obedience. The rule of obedience revealed to Adam in the state of innocence and all mankind in him, besides a special command not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 93. What is the moral law? The moral law is the declaration of the will of God to mankind directing and binding everyone to personal, perfect, and perpetual conformity and obedience thereunto. In the frame and disposition of the whole man, soul and body, and in performance of all those duties of holiness and righteousness which he oweth to God and man, promising life upon the fulfilling and threatening death. Upon the breach of it. And now we turn talking about another confession, this by Cyril Luker in the 1630s, a reformed martyr in orthodoxy. Talking about his confession, the first 11, 16 chapters. Now we talk the remaining 10 chapters of this confession breathe the reformed spirit. Chapter 2 asserts the authority of scriptures is superior to the authority of the church. And since the scriptures alone, being divinely inspired, cannot err. In the appendix to the second Greek edition, Cyril commends the general circulation of the scriptures and maintains their perspicuity in matters of faith but excludes the Apocrypha and rejects the worship of images. That's a big deal right there in Greece. He believes that the church is sanctified and taught by the Holy Spirit in the way of life, but denies its infallibility. The church is liable to sin, hamartane, and and to choose the error instead of truth. Antites Alatheus Topsiudis Ecclesi. From such error can only be delivered by the teaching and light of the Holy Spirit and not any mortal man. Chapter 22. The doctrine of justification. I'm sorry, that was chapter 12. Chapter 13, the doctrine of justification. Here is it. I've got a marginal note. Wow. For this Greek man, patriarch. We believe that a man is justified by faith, not by works. But when we say by faith, we understand the correlative of faith, the righteousness of Christ, which faith fulfilling the office of the hand apprehends and applies to us for salvation. And this we understand to be fully consistent with and in no wise to the prejudice of works. For the truth itself teaches us that works also are not to be neglected and that they are necessary means and testimonies of our faith and a confirmation of our calling. But as human frailty bears witness, they are themselves by no means sufficient to save man and able to appear at the judgment seat of Christ so as to merit the reward of salvation. 
the righteousness of Christ applied to the penitent alone justifies and saves the believer. That's a bombshell in Eastern Orthodoxy that is denied. The freedom of the will before regeneration is denied, chapter 14. That's another bombshell. And it says in Greek, Bistuomen and dois uk we believe that before generation, alta zuxia necron ani, we are dead. In the doctrine of decrees, Cyril agrees with the Calvinistic system, chapter 3, and thereby offended Grotius and the Arminians. He accepts with the Protestants only two sacraments as being instituted by Christ instead of side seven and requires faith as a condition of their application. He rejects the dogma of transubstantiation and oral manduction and teaches the Calvinistic theory of real but spiritual presence and frustra frustra and fruition of the body and blood of Christ by believers only. In the last chapter, he rejects the doctrine of purgatory and the possibility of repentance after death. And as we noted earlier, the Greeks crucified that confession and had him assassinated, actually. We turn from our elections and the confession to prayer. Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save them that rule and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time. Because there is no one else who fights for us but you only, O God of hosts. O God, may clean our hearts within us, sweep them clean, and take not the power and presence of the Holy Spirit from us. O Lord, we beseech thee, absolve thy people from their offenses, and through your manifold goodness they may be delivered from the bonds and bands and the residual encrustations of sins which by our frailty we have committed. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for Christ's sake, our blessed Lord and Savior. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom stands assuredly our eternal life, Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults and insults of our enemies, that we, trusting in thy defense, may smile at our foes, may return fire, and may never fear the power of our adversaries. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you've brought us to the beginning of another day, day for which we give thanks. Defend us in thy, this day by thy mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, but that every doing, every thought, every feeling may be ordered by thy governments and may be righteous and pleasing in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, whose kingdom is everlasting and is across the face of this planet, we pray of your mercy to direct and prosper those who bear authority in this nation, that they may repent Break their hearts, walk in humility, seek your word, speak truth as they serve the people of this nation. 
Grant, we pray, that true religion and piety, peace and unity, truth and justice, especially truth, O Lord, in these days of much lying, may be established amongst us for all generations. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God who works miracles like the resurrection, send down upon the men, bishops, pastors, and others and the congregations committed to their charge. Spiritual repentance, humility, and the renewing spirit of thy grace. And that they may please thee, let them kneel and learn from thy word. Pour upon them the spirit of thy helpful grace and blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our advocate and mediator, our victor, our conqueror, our warrior, our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, who's given us grace at this time, with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee. And as promised that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, I will grant the requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, those desires, those petitions of thy servants as is best for them, expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge, head knowledge, heart knowledge, of thy truth and in the life to come everlasting life through jesus christ our lord amen the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy ghost to be with us all evermore amen here ends the order for morning prayer daily